back to Uncharted X. My name is Ben, and today I'm doing something a little different. This will be a Q&A video. Uh, so most of my videos are kind of these long produced pieces about various, you know, ancient sites and, you know, topics, and lots of questions come up in the comments sections as well as through social media and email and that type of thing. So I wanted to take a few minutes, I guess, to answer a few of those, use some of my footage to illustrate kind of what I'm talking about. I uh, hope you'll enjoy the video. It's been brought to you today by the documentary streaming service Curiosity Stream. We'll talk a bit more about them later, but without any more ado, let's get into the first question. The first question is uh, one that came from William Kane. I think this one came in on, uh, as a PayPal comment. And he asks, uh, do you know of any engineering studies about the megalithic structures having a resistance to earthquakes? I'm interested in the level of mathematics by the ancient peoples. That's an interesting question. Certainly, this is uh, something that you, you hear said a lot about megalithic structures is that they all seem to be uh, somewhat at least earthquake proof. Uh, I don't know of any specific engineering studies that have really analyzed this, although I've seen it mentioned by engineers. I know it, it comes up, I think, in Revelations of the Pyramids, uh, which is a great documentary, and they interviewed a, a, a number of engineers about this topic. And, you know, of course, there are a couple of sites that are particularly well known for this. Uh, the ones that come to mind are things like Saxe Huaman uh, in Peru, and then, of course, all of the many of the megalithic works, at least uh, in Egypt. There, there are... There have been a couple studies done about the effects that earthquakes have ha have had on some of these megalithic structures. Uh, some of those are relatively interesting because it's we can't really say, I guess, that they're earthquake proof. If you get a, enough of a, a, an earthquake or a, or a cataclysm, you're going to get some damage. And we, in fact, know that happened, for example, uh, on the Great Pyramid. There was a, a very a massive earthquake that struck that region in 1303 AD which was known to have then dislodged a few of the casing stones on the Great Pyramid that then caused those to come out and gave, I guess, all the people living there at the time access to then go up and start prying away and peeling out more casing stones. And it led to, you know, a, a long period of quarrying on that site. And today, you know, the, the Great Pyramid stands there without any of its casing stones. It must have been quite a sight uh, to behold when it had. Uh, there, there are another another few sites that you can point to that have evidence of cataclysmic damage happening to them. And one of those that strikes me is really Saxe Huaman. And I'm not really talking about the main wall, the, the, the feature that is so iconic of that site. It's more of what you would call the Hanan Pacha or the monolithic architecture that's kind of over the back. It's, it's around the, the, the back hill, I guess, from, at Saxe Huaman. There's just these huge, huge blocks of, of stone that are all carved. And it's as if they've been jumbled about. And some of these blocks have got away a couple hundred tons. They're like they're just chunks of mountainsides that have been carved. And when you go through there today, it's almost as if there are these upside down staircases. You you get the sense that the whole place has been jumbled about. Uh, and in fact, the same sort of thing strikes me at places like Alante Tambo, where it, it kind of it gets it gets uh, attributed as well. They you know they they didn't quite finish building it or. You know, it's 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 the damage is explained that sort of a way that that the the Inca never quite finished building it, and then there was an earthquake. But to me, it's like, well, there's something here probably before that that they found in a damaged state, and they did their best to restore. There's actually quite an interesting article that was uh, published recently, in fact, in the Peruvian Times. I think Wednesday, May 13th, I saw this article that says the earthquake struck Machu Picchu in 1450, and this is the result of a a, a fairly lengthy study into it. And what they're saying is that much of the damage that we see at Machu Picchu was caused by this earthquake. And of course, this is another site where we can see some damage that's happened to the site. Uh, famously, there's that one wall that's in the main megalithic core that, that is sort of tilted to one side, hasn't quite fallen apart. Although, I think the explanation there is more in terms of, of sinkage underneath the foundations of that wall that's caused this rather than outright earthquake damage. But there was something in this article that I found kind of interesting and it's I guess it shows the way these things uh, are studied and I guess how they're thought about because it's a little bit of a logical inconsistency here um, just quoting from this from this article uh, so Benevente who I assume is one of these scientists that, that that worked on this Benevente and this is quoting the article Benevente said that quote there is no doubt end quote that the strong earthquake also caused the deformation of the walls of Saxe Huaman, Tipon and Tambo Mache, as well as along the street of the 12 angle stone in the city of Cusco amongst other areas. 
As a result, the Inca moved away from using smaller stones assembled in a more rustic cellular architecture and continued to develop and perfect seismic resistance seismic resistant trapezoidal structures with giant stone blocks at the base with narrower upper upper walls. End quote. So this is to me a little interesting and also just because it's logically inconsistent what they're saying here is that well the Inca were building using this this rustic rough style of smaller stones then they had an earthquake and then that caused them to build in these trapezoidal large giant megalithic walls that you know we see at Sacsayhuaman in Cusco and other areas well that's interesting because it seems like those larger trapezoidal and earthquake resistant buildings are in the bottom layers. How come all of these small stones that you say that these the Inca moved away from using, they're now on top? I mean, how how does that work? You, you, it's it's very inconsistent with what you're saying. It's you say that well, this earthquake destroyed the stuff we see at Sacsayhuaman, but this was also the catalyst for the Inca to then move away from their rustic style to move to the wards trap tra, the, the larger megalithic style. I mean, which one is it? The larger megalithic style is always on the bottom of these sites. It's obviously, to my mind at least, far older than the than the more rustic style, and that's the stuff that came later. Certainly, if you were trying to avoid earthquake damage. Uh, you wouldn't sh then move to a, a a style of building that is much more prone to damage from earthquakes, which would be the case uh, if you were just building using the small stones that that likely is what the Inca were doing. So uh, it's just a good indication of kind of how the establishment. I mean, this is an interesting study about Machu Picchu, but they're trying to trying to sort of shoehorn that the theory of this earthquake into the conventional story of history when if you approach it with a more open mind thinking well you know, perhaps there's some of this megalithic work has been here for a longer time and perhaps it's been subject to larger earthquakes than the one they discovered in 1456 uh that may be the source of some of this damage i mean no doubt earthquakes strike these sites and, and no doubt they they have an effect um but there really is a remarkable element of that megalithic construction that that makes it earthquake resistant uh, and as as I talk through this, I, I want you to look at this bit of footage about on one of these blocks that makes up one of the interior walls in the Coricancha, which is the giant megalithic building at the center of Cusco, uh, which, of course, is now a Catholic church. Uh, take a look at this one seam of this one block. And this is a single block. And this is the horizontal line as we pan around. It's kind of hard to see with the glass and, and a few things. But just note that this is all the one... Uh, seam of a single stone that then it's it's in three dimensions it's a massive stone that's shaped in all sorts of uh, different directions but it's one piece and this is the type of thing that we why we attribute um, this earthquake resistant property to these megalithic buildings because there is no single um, line of force if you like there's no single fault line vertically in these walls we see the same thing in the Sphinx or the, the Valley Temple at Giza. Uh, uh, we see it in the Coricancha. We see it in, in a lot of buildings that are megalithic in origin uh, all around the world. But this one particular stone in, in that wall of the Coricancha just blows my mind. And you can also see where the Spanish have destroyed a section of this wall. And what I like about this is, apart from the destruction, it actually gives us a look on the interior of those joints. So I've heard it said that sometimes, well, they, they made these the joins between these stones perfect on the outside, but but on the interior spaces, they weren't worried about this perfection in terms of joinery. And you can quite clearly see here how that just isn't the case. You can't, you can barely even make out the join between these two stones. And this was as a result of the Spanish kind of destroying the place, looking for buried treasure or treasure hidden inside the walls or something like that. The other element of your question, which was the, the level of mathematics uh, as evidenced by the ancient peoples, and I think there's there's a lot of evidence that suggests that was obviously a well-established art even in the megalithic time. Uh, certainly also, we know ancient cultures had a fairly high degree, or many of them at least had a fairly high degree of understanding of mathematics. Uh, one of my videos, I think it's uh, it's the connection, curious connection between the Great Pyramid and the maps of the ancient sea kings explores some of these details. Uh, when you, we look at some of the mathematical properties of the Great Pyramid, the way that it, it encompasses things like pi, it encompasses the, uh, essentially it's a scale model of the northern hemisphere of the planet. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of sacred geometry and just fundamental mathematics encoded in that one monument. So check that video out if you haven't seen it. Uh, the other thing that I'd mention is 
uh, also mentioned in that book is is this is or in that video is something that's contained in this book by Charles Hapgood, which is Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, and it gets into a lot of detail around the mathematics of map projections that was very sophisticated. Uh, it, it it was it 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 shows a very sophisticated understanding of both mathematics and the, the the planet that is required to then you know project a flat map onto a a, a spherical or you know a, a globe earth um, that's a complicated mathematical procedure and we we see evidence of this coming from some of the very earliest maps uh, that are known to to still exist and some of those maps draw from even earlier source maps uh, that are now lost to us that were lost in the, the Library of Alexandria and other sources so to me there's there's a lot of evidence that suggests you know a ton of mathematical aptitude particularly the further back in time that we go so here's a question from Derek Press. This one is on YouTube. Uh, he writes, Should we not be looking for structures 400 feet underwater? The then civilization would have been living on the coast that is now 400 feet below the oceans. And that's a succinct way of, of, of describing the situation. Uh, indeed, that's, I think that is where we should be looking. And this is a really interesting uh, area because despite all of the, I guess, underwater exploration that goes on, uh, marine archaeology is almost entirely focused on shipwrecks. There has been no real widespread uh, detailed surveying of these areas in order to look for things like structures. Uh, almost all of it goes into like, let's go find a shipwreck and find some gold or find something this and that. That all, all, all that stuff that happened well and truly after that land was inundated. And it's, you know, you've seen the the, the gif of it where you show the, the world before this period and the world after. You can even go into Google Google Maps and uh, Google Earth and, and find plugins that, that let you show what the world would look like with that with that extra three four hundred feet of water. Uh, and all of that happened in a fairly short period uh, with the you know these these huge floods um, that occurred at the end of the last ice age. The sea levels rose more or less to the, the levels that they are today. And indeed, I think that's where we should be looking. Um, and there's, I think there is a lot to explore here. In fact, uh, I've done a lot of diving in, in the past. Like I, for a while, lived in Singapore and before that, Australia. And I, I spent many years doing nothing in, with my spare time and weekends other than diving. Uh, it's something I'd like to get back to. And in fact, I had, we had some plans to go and explore some interesting um, things that, we had, that, that had been found more or less recently uh, with a few other people. You, if any of you uh, are tuned into Randall Carlson's podcast, Cosmographia, uh, you, might have, you might have heard this little clip that happened on in the introduction to one of the shows. Yeah, but I, I, I feel you on the being bummed out. We, we also had a super secret expeditionary trip planned with George Howard and yeah. Ben from Uncharted X and Chris Cottrell from Dabbler's Den, and we were going to go do some super secret investigation yeah. and that had to be canceled as well so that was like last week and then this week would have been zion canyon and so yeah uh, unfortunately due to the situation with the thing that shall not be named that is causing everybody to stay at home at the moment uh it got in the way of the plans that we had all laid in fact i had to we had to luckily i had travel insurance because uh i had to claim it all all back all my hotels got cancelled we couldn't do the trip but uh george howard uh obviously he, i interviewed him on my channel the snake brothers kyle and russ uh chris cottrell from dabbler's den we had uh put in some pretty we, we had laid some pretty serious plans to go and do some exploration of some interesting things uh off in the ocean and in fact part of that and, and this is one of the reasons that i was so excited about doing it i think part of the the, the thing that makes a, this type of exploration so much more feasible today is the is the is the rise of essentially underwater drones um in fact i'd made arrangements to hire one of these uh in order to do this but you can now get uh these underwater drones that that, that affect they operate like the you know the, the drones that fly around you get a couple of hours of battery time out of them they'll go down to about 300 to 400 feet they're on you know tether line of 400 feet perfect for investigating these areas uh that are just off the coastlands that are within that three to four hundred feet um uh, depth indicator, or even shallower in a lot of cases. Uh, they're perfect instruments for it. They're, they record in 4K. They've got lights. You get a couple hours of footage off it. Uh, I think I think these types of things should lead to some interesting discoveries. And of course, you know we know about a lot of underwater sites. I mean, there was the Dwarka, I think it was, the lost city off off the Indian coast up up north there. Um, when that tsunami, the Boxing Day tsunami 
uh, and earthquake hit, the, the, when the sea pulled back, it, 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 it revealed a city that was, you know, kilometers wide off the coast of India. The vast city, which is, this is quoting the article, the vast city, which is five miles long and two miles wide, is believed to predate the oldest known remains in the subcontinent by more than 5,000 years. The site was discovered by chance last year by oceanographers from India's National Institute of Ocean Technology who were conducting a survey of pollution. Again, not looking for this stuff. They were doing other things in that area, but this turned up. Uh, there's a ho there's articles that talk about a number of different lost cities or, or cities that have been found underwater. I know Jimmy from Bright Insights done a few videos on the underwater uh, monuments and things that you can find. And it's really hard to explain many of them because we have a very good understanding of when the sea levels rose. Like This is not something that's really in dispute. We know when that happened. And typically that, that date predates our, all known dates for, for, for civilization. Uh, of course, there's the other uh, big unknown, or I guess the other big site that gets talked about. I know I've talked about it a few times, which is uh, Yonaguni in Japan. This is quite an interesting site. I mean, I've talked to Graham Hancock about this. He's talked a lot about it. Uh, he's seen it. He's dived on it. He's convinced that it's man-made. I've seen a lot of the, the footage of this site. It's a place that I'd love to go to and dive on myself one day. I know it's a difficult dive, but I'm, I'm a pretty experienced diver and I'm a strong swimmer, so... Uh, I'm not worried about that aspect of it, um, but I would love to get down there and see it for myself because there is some other interesting documentaries on YouTube that, that explore this, I guess, from the other perspective. And one of the ones that I found that you may not have seen, this is actually a, a documentary that comes from Monty Hall, who does basically diving documentaries. A lot of his stuff is diving oriented. But he went to Yonaguni and he also uh, interviewed Robert Schock as part of this. Uh, and Shock sort of takes the opposite position from Hancock on this. And in fact, if you go up and look at the shoreline near Yonaguni, the, the rock formation does look an awful lot like what you see under the water. Although some of the pictures and some of the footage I've seen of Yonaguni are just, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to believe that this is a potentially natural uh, formation. I think it's. I think it needs a lot more investigation and research. My mind isn't really made up one way or the other. I believe that Graham Hancock thinks it's man-made, and I put a lot of trust in his judgment. Uh, but it's a site that I'd love to to see for myself uh, one of these days. But that's a really interesting documentary. Uh, I'll provide a link to that down below. You should check it out. And while we're speaking about documentaries, today's video is being brought to you by CuriosityStream, which is an on-demand platform for thousands of streaming documentaries that cover nature, science, technology, and of course, history. I'm a member of this service. Uh, I find it really valuable. Uh, I haven't had regular TV in my life for more than a decade now. I spend a lot of my spare time watching documentaries, as I'm sure many of you do as well, uh, particularly if you're subscribed to this channel. So, you know, this is a service that I can really get behind. And they're running just an amazing promotion at the moment. Uh, it's only $12 for a full year of access to the service. And if you use the sign up or promo code Uncharted X, you get the first month of that free. That's only $1 a month uh, for a full year of access to just thousands of excellent documentaries that cover a bunch of different topics. As I said, I'm a member of the service. I've pretty predictably really been getting a lot of value out of their ancient history catalog. There's a ton of really interesting documentaries about a lot of different sites and topics there, including an extended cut version of the documentary that covers the Scan Pyramid Project, the recent effort to scan the Great Pyramids using all sorts of cosmic ray and muon detection that has revealed that really large void in the pyramid. It's, it's worth checking out. There are also just thousands more documentaries covering just tons of other topics on there as well. So go to curiositystream.com slash unchartedx in order to get access to this deal. I think there's a tremendous amount of value here. It's like I said, $12 for a full year of content and uh, a month free if you use the Uncharted X promo code. And the more people that sign up to it, uh, using that promo code, the, the more it helps me out. So if you like some of the work that I'm doing on this channel here at Uncharted X, by doing this, I think it's a great way to both help support the channel as well as just get you know tremendous value back in return with access to just thousands of documentaries on, uh, on a great streaming platform. And I'd also like to say just a huge thank you to CuriosityStream for reaching out and choosing to sponsor this video. So another question here comes from Lee Buttrill. Uh, I think this was also through PayPal. Uh, and he writes, keep up the good work, Ben. You bring reason to a subject that most think is fantasy. I'd love to hear your thoughts on where we could find the ancient civilizations workshop someday. 
Uh, thanks for that question, Lee. It, it is an interesting question, isn't it? And there's actually, I'm going to combine this with the, the next question that it comes up often, which is where are the tools, but we'll get to that. Uh, in terms of the ancient civilizations workshop, there's a lot of places we could be looking. Um, there is obviously, to me, the big thing that, that the big area of the planet that we haven't yet explored fully, I would say, is those coastal regions, the, the 10 million square miles of land that were inundated uh, around the end of the Younger Dryas with the, the, the massive and sudden rise of the sea levels. If you accept the premise that, there, that some of these megalithic origins and these, the, these original civilizations existed in times prior to that, uh, particularly during the, the end of the Ice Age, uh, then those are, the, those are the regions of the Earth that, that they would have likely inhabited because you know, they were coastal, you had access to the sea for, for, for travel, trade, uh, for, for, for fishing and, and, and life support life support i guess it would have been cold in a lot of other regions if you were too up too high up in the in the mountains it would have been extremely cold so i think these are the areas of the planet that we should be looking for them the other thing that i'd mention is is gobekli tepe um as the f the oldest megalithic site that we know and the the structure of gobekli tepe is is a, is a whole series of these stone circles uh that seem to consist of these upright megaliths and and uh, it's as if they stamped them out. And I've heard it said, I think it may have been Graham Hancock that might have, have said this, that it's almost as if they were training people on how to build these these kind of megalithic circles. It's almost as if these were could have been the progenitor for other great stone circles that we know exist all over the place. But certainly at Gobekli Tepe, there are a whole number of them. Um, there, there's far more in the ground still that have not been uncovered than, than the small amount that have been uncovered. Apparently that site is, is quite massive. Uh, and recently there's been an interesting study done by a group of, I think, Israeli scientists that did some uh, look, that analyzed the layout of several of these circles and particularly the, the core three. They, they've found that, that when you map the centers of these uh, different stone circles, they form essentially an equilateral triangle which which also pertains to the last question about mathematics but it, it sort of indicates that perhaps there was some overall design uh thinking going into this that said M martin sweatman has a really interesting take on this uh from his work sort of with statistical analysis of this type of thing he's a little more skeptical about this claim saying that well that this could have actually happened by accident um, there's a number of ways to explain how this is how these the center of these three uh, circles that Gobekli Tepe may have ended up forming something like an equilateral triangle. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of undecided on whether that was done for a purpose or if it happened by accident. The other aspect that I would combine with this uh, is is one that I'll, I'll reference again later. But this is, it's it really has to do with our perspective on technology. So it, when you look at megalithic work and all of these ancient uh, and just unexplainable high precision artifacts, things like the boxes in the Serapium and the, the statues at Luxor and Karnak. Uh, we tend to, to try and explain them by looking at it through our lens of technology. And now, certainly our, our perspective on technology, we've probably gone further than any other humans have in many areas. But that's not to say that we know everything about it. Obviously, in 100 years, we're going to, get, going to know more about fundamentals not only of science, but our technology will progress. There are whole areas of both science and technology that we've barely tapped into at, at this point. And we, it's, it's hard to, to look at a lot of these things without peering at them through our understanding of how we would get things done through you know, um, hydraulic power and, and power tools and, 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 and the way that we manipulate matter, things like stone and that. It's entirely possible, not saying that this is the case, but it is possible that there are answers to those questions that lie outside the realms of our current understanding. So it, it is possible, I think, that at some point in the past, there was different forms of technology, perhaps not the same as us when you talk about advanced, you know, high, high technology civilizations in the past. It may not have meant that they were exactly like us in our technology. They may have developed and, and evolved down different paths of technology. So I always try to try to keep that concept of perspective on technology in mind. And the same thing applies to the, I guess, the tools question, like where are the tools? 
why do the tools have to look exactly like the tools we would use to do some of these things? Perhaps they were different tools. Perhaps they functioned entirely differently to us. Perhaps the answers to those methodologies and those and that technology that they used may come to us uh, in the future with more study. And that, that's why I, I constantly think that we should be more open-minded in our approach to studying these mysteries of the past because with that study, by bringing everything we have to bear on the problem with an open mind, you know, and, and being receptive to the idea that maybe there's technology here that we have yet to fully grasp and comprehend, that's probably a path that we could take that would reveal more to us, right? It might actually benefit us in the long run to analyze these things more closely and with more open minds. But if you are fixed in your perspective and saying that, well, this, these things were all done by primitive people using primitive tools and primitive methods, then that's the box you're, you're only going to look for solutions in, right? That's the only way that you can frame a solution. Uh, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. And there's, there seems to be a lack of real mainstream scientific analysis that, 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 that opens its mind to, to, to answers beyond that. So that, that's why I tend to say, I, I mean, I don't have the answers, but I think we should be looking at these sites and at these mysteries with more of an open mind. So, and, and another question here that's kind of in the same ballpark I wanted to combine with that last one. This one comes from Rich Johnson, uh, and he writes, A big question I'm searching for an answer to is why we haven't found fossilized evidence of the advanced tools these ancient civilizations would have had. For instance, a drill bit or a saw blade. If it was before the Younger Dryas of 13,000 years ago, the oxidation would render them piles of rust, but wouldn't there be something of a mud-cast fossil of, of at least one artifact to be found of something like an advanced item such as an iPhone? It's a, it's a very good question, Rich. This, this is something that comes up a lot. It's like, well, if you claim that there was an advanced you know, ancient civilization that built these things and these all required you know, advanced technology, then where are the tools? Uh, there's, it's a, and it's a valid question, right? We don't, we don't have the tools. We, can't, we, we don't have any evidence of tools that did this. But what I would say is that, is that what we do have is we have, we have evidence of the tools in the result of the tools. We have the boxes. We have the flat slabs. We have the precision statues and, and columns and obelisks. And what we do know is that you simply cannot make these things with the tools that are currently in the archaeological record. So the, the very primitive, you know, the, the, the copper chisels we all like to talk about, the pounding stones, you know, the, the, the really primitive plumb bobs and, and string lines and things like that, they are insufficient to manufacture these objects that we see. So you, you're kind of left in a, an interesting uh, position when, when you analyze this. And this, this is the conundrum or the, the corner that I think a lot of uh, mainstream archaeology and, and Egyptology in particular has painted itself into. We and there's been I would you know point you back to Chris Dunn and uh, there's a number of engineers, almost any construction expert, engineer, stonemason that looks at those objects like the boxes and the serapium, the pres the precision you know slabs. I've shown a ton of these things. Uh, almost all of those people understand that these things cannot be made simply with hand tools, time and effort. Uh, and in fact, every attempt that I've ever seen of people trying to recreate or recreate these things uh, in that fashion has failed. So the position you're left with is, is either we've greatly underestimated ancient civilizations as we know it, or they didn't make them. There's, so, you know, if you look at those precision objects it's, and say, let's talk about the Inca in South America, either they had the capability to work in stone to produce things like Saxe Huaman. and the, this you know that's not does not seem to be at all part of what we know about the Inca. Certainly doesn't seem to match up to the tools, the basic pounding stones, even the 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 records of the, the Spanish conquistadors that that observed the Inca working on some of these sites using just very primitive methods, no levers, no no rolling stones, no nothing. They were just literally hauling on ropes, uh, trying to move some of these big stones around. Uh, same thing with the Egyptians. We the, the, the tools that we have of the Egyptians cannot manufacture those objects. So either we've greatly underestimated them and they did have tools that we don't have access to or we haven't found, or they didn't make them. And it's it's a difficult choice and because there, there's no room, it seems like, in the orthodox explanation of history to um, 
to 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 say well there is you know uh, there there may have been an, a more advanced and a more ancient civilization that preceded some of these ancient civilizations they they always are stuck trying to explain how these precision objects are made with very you know uh primitive tools uh, the other comment i'd offer about the tools is that yes although we have we have evidence of of the tools use in the objects themselves but in a lot of cases um these tools were likely massive and probably very valuable much as our tools are today when you go to a major works uh, work sites and things like that craftsmen don't really leave their tools laying around um i mean unless there was some ultimate destruction that really not killed everybody on the site they left everything scattered around in almost any other case, those tools are going to be removed and taken from the site when the job's done. Um, you just don't leave these things laying around. And perhaps that's a reason for why we haven't found any of the tools. The other thing is that we we know if you, again, accept the premise that there's been you know an ancient megalithic um, civilization that built these things, if there were tools left laying around, uh, there's been many other civilizations that have lived on these sites and they may have taken these tools. They may have disassembled them, used them. If something was made from metal, perhaps they reused that metal. They, you know, they did something with it. We're not, in very, in very few cases do we find any pristine, you know, megalithic stuff that comes from, you know, that's been untouched by, by, by later civilizations. I think there's a lot of that going on. There is one other comparison that I like to make when the, the tools question comes up, and particularly this kind of relates to technology more so than specifically tools. When you look at, say, the Giza Plateau and, and the Great Pyramid, with all the evidence for precision and just mastery of stonework there, uh, there, is, there is quite clearly technology involved in that effort. Now, the way this gets explained by guys like Zahi Hawass, and I, I actually have a really bad audio clip of him talking about this. I mean, he pins it down to something, they, they call it the national project approach. So the way that this massive edifice and all of this effort was built was purely on the basis of people, you know, an entire civilization got behind it. Like this was almost a religious fervor uh, that they all dedicated themselves and a great percentage of the output of that civilization to achieving these monuments. Um, that's, it's, I think that's certainly a part of, of what of what happened but you you can't really pin everything on that there is still some technology involved in creating things like the king's chamber in creating the precision of the great pyramid technologies involved in lifting up those 60 70 80 ton granite blocks to the height that they're at for the for that for the king's chamber there's many aspects of it that require technology and the modern analogy for this is really the the moon missions of the 60s and 70s um, getting to the moon, it's, it's why we haven't been back there, I think, is that it was a national project, right? There was, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of competition between Russia and the US at the time. There was the space race was going on. Uh, if you look at the percentage of, you know, of, of GDP or the percentage of the budget of the entire country that went into the space program and NASA to get to the moon, it was it was orders of magnitude higher than it is today, and that's the type of thing that I think is required to really make that happen. So in some ways, this was very much a national project. The whole country was behind it. A lot of the resources of the country were being put into it. But you know, it wasn't a case of simply all the people in America coming together and kind of throwing astronauts at the moon, was it? It was. It, there was technology involved. We could not have achieved that outcome without significant gains. Uh, in technology. So th I think the same thing applies to some of these massive monuments of the past. Although you, 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 I think there's some merit to the idea that these were national projects and a, a large chunk of their civilization, country, whatever, were, were, was, was put towards achieving those goals. It simply isn't possible without significant technology. And that's where the disparity between you know, what we see on the ground, the evidence we have for high technology and, you know, sophisticated tools it's there's a mismatch between that and the, the capabilities of the ancient civilizations that we credit these these the building of these these uh, monuments with there's a gap there and that that's the gap that i keep trying to to poke into it's that's the corner we're painted into we, we you either have to say that we've underestimated ancient civilizations and they were far more capable and had far higher degrees of technology than than we believe they did or they didn't build them 
Another question, this one from Robert Lucason, and this one's a bit more detail oriented. Uh, the question, he writes, the question rises, how advanced is that lost civilization? I mean, it only discusses the metals or jewels needed that were hard enough to cut through the harder stone. What about chemistry? Did they find any proof of acids or substances that dissolve stone? My guess is that the core dissolved slightly while being drilled. While drilling deeper and longer, the cone was exposed extensively to an abrasive substance eating away the core. How else does a core get a cone? Uh, this, is a, a, a to this is a question that relates specifically to the documentary about the tube drills that I made. So uh, I'll get into this a little bit. Uh, the cone shape, I think, is explainable by if you consider the tube drill might have been might have been straight on the outside, but if it was slightly cone shaped on the inside such that it was thicker at the top, as that progressed into the stone, that would give you uh, the cone shape. There isn't really any evidence in the, the cores that we have, and there is more cores, there are more cores than just Petrie's core number seven uh, that indicates a, any dissolving or any chemicals being used. In fact, uh, Petrie describes the ripping of the mica, so it's as if whatever it was that traced those lines that, that carved that stone, uh, it, 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 it carved almost better through the quartz and the harder material than it did through the, the softer material, which it tend to sort of rip out of the, the, the core itself. But one thing that he does mention, I know Chris Dunn makes mention of this as well in his books, is that the, the core seems to have a burnished finish to it. Perhaps, I don't know if vitrified is the right word, but it certainly seemed as if it had some effect. Maybe it was heat or something like that. And in fact, in Chris Dunn's book, um, Lost Technologies of, of Ancient Egypt, he does speculate that perhaps a technique such as a thermal lance may have been used to, to explain that just incredible penetration rate that is shown by those spiral grooves on those drill cores. So that such something that, that you know, sacrifices its own material in order to penetrate into uh, the stone and, and cut away at that shape. It's a real open question. Uh, the, other, the other thing you mentioned here was chemistry and substances that affect stone. Uh, I would recommend go and take a look at the video. I think it's called the, the Evidence for Liquid Polishing in the Serapeum. Uh, when you go to the Serapeum, if ever you get the chance and you get in to have a close look at that big one box they let you write in on, the one with, uh, with all of the writing, there is what I can only describe as some astonishing evidence for some form of liquid polishing that went on. This is chemistry or alchemy or call it what you want. Um, and it, you really have to see it and feel it to, to understand what I'm talking about. It's as if, because most of that box is, is perfectly polished with the mirror shine, this isn't a natural property of granite, there are other surfaces like the undersides of the lids that were not polished to that final mirror sheen. But so if you consider where the lid is, you've got the vertical surface, you've got the underside of it, and because the lids askew on the box, you can see that where the sides are perfectly like sort of mirror finished, Underneath, on the, the, the lip, underneath the, the, the edge of the lid, it's as if these little eddies and droplets, and it's a very liquid-looking shape, as if a, the shape water might take if it was running down the side of it, the way it would pool up underneath and then drip off. Those eddies and those little pools look like and feel like uh, there's just the same level of, and degree of polish that's on the rest of the box. The only way that we do that type of thing in our civilization today is with mechanical polishing. We can't achieve the same thing through any chemical means as far as I know. I think this is, is strong evidence for some form of, of just unexplained or, or not yet understood technology that, in, that, that involves perhaps chemistry. Um, once again, when the, the question is how advanced is the advanced civilization, uh, I do think that a lot of the uh, answers to questions like, you know, what if if the pyramids and the Giza Plateau and all of that area, if that was somehow functional back in the day, what was its function? I think, the, and how was were some of these things achieved? I think the answers to those things, again, may lay outside of our perspective. And the best way to get to an answer is to investigate them with open minds to whatever solution we come up with. There are a couple of questions here about my recent series on Machu Picchu. So this one is from Carl P, again on YouTube. And he writes, from the original megalithic stonework, it doesn't appear that Machu Picchu was a place of habitation, much less serious agriculture. It begs the question as to why or how an ancient civilization invested such time and effort to build an, to build an observatory complex in this very hard terrain. The dwellings are Incan. A feature of tropical soils is that they are not fertile and habitation of only 80 years by the Inca could be a reflection of that. 
Clearly the original builders didn't make the mistake of actually living there in any great numbers. And then uh, a follow-up comment to, to his comment by Ian Danziol says that be interesting to know if, they're, if they used a version of Terra Preta in the terraces, which is the Amazonian Black Earth supersoil. Um, good questions about uh, Machu Picchu. Yeah, indeed, that it doesn't seem like there was any great population living there at any time. Although, as um, Rogerio points out in my videos, only a, a few hours walk uh, distant, there were uh, giant terraces um, that had that gr would have been able to grow a lot of food that existed in all three climate zones that they used to cultivate different levels of crops. So it's possible that if there were people living at Machu Picchu, even in the Inca times, they were being supplied by uh, these nearby farming terraces that, that is connected via that Inca, the Inca trails and the Inca roadway. Um, I, I, I don't know about the Terra Preta situation there. Now, Terra Preta is a very interesting topic if you haven't heard of it. Uh, it turns out that a lot of the soil, and this is still used today, there's a huge portions of the Amazon the whole basin uh, appears to have been almost geoengineered or effectively geoengineered with terra preta, which is a man-made uh, combination of soil and ash and different sort of, I guess, um, uh, bacteria and biotics, so to, such that it becomes extremely fertile. And even today, like terra preta is really highly, highly valued for farmland because crops grow really well there. And all the evidence for it suggests that this was actually made and manufactured. And there are just you know, huge areas of the Amazon that they found have been essentially seeded and created with this man-made soil. It doesn't occur naturally, which is just mind-blowing. And and the more we look in the Amazon, and this is one of the, un uh, I guess, fortunate side effects of a very unfortunate process of the deforestation, uh, is that it's revealing all of these remains of what must have been ancient cities in the Amazon. So again, he's entirely, you know, undocumented chapters of of human history that exist in that amazon basin that who knows this could have been connected to any any number of of ancient civilizations that we know nothing about here's another question uh, about machu picchu from uh devon 87 i think it is who says what's the weather like temperature wise ben uh, i should have mentioned this in the video i was trying to give people tips about the best way to go and, and structure a visit to Machu Picchu. Uh, the, the weather in Peru and Bolivia, particularly in the Andes and the Sacred Valley, uh, it, can be, it can be beautiful. And in the sun, it can be t-shirt weather, but it can also quite quickly turn to cold and even rain um, relatively rapidly because you're up in high elevation in the mountains. So uh, ultimately, I would suggest that uh, layering is the best approach. Take, take jeans, take long pants, take a, a selection of layers and you may also want to plan for rain when you go there because it, it may it may catch you out at some point it's caught me out a few times out and about but yeah i found layering is the best approach for south america uh in uh, particularly in the, the the higher altitudes another question on machu picchu from domestique which is a pretty cool cycling name uh would like to see all of the artifacts that have been found around the site besides there are underground tunnels and cavities uh, our questions maybe could be answered by investigating the site. There are hundreds of kilometers of underground tunnels, but the authorities closed them all up, unfortunately. Yeah, this is an interesting aspect of um, a lot of South American sites. There are definitely much uh, that's been built underground in these areas. I know that in Cusco, I've heard some uh, sort of firsthand anecdotal accounts of where they were digging up to do you know, uh, street work and uh, installing things underground in Cusco. They've been there's been an occasional too where they found staircases, they found tunnels that go down. A lot of cases they get they get plugged up. There are rumors of tunnels that run from the top of Sacsayhuaman all the way into the Coricancha, uh, which is in the center of Cusco and 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 you know way down, uh, way down the mountain. Uh, I think that's it's a good. I think there are there's most likely a lot of underground construction on a lot of these sites, and in some places we're just seeing the the top layers of things. This happens also all over the world. We're finding more and more underground um, construction. Uh, obviously, Turkey, Cappadocia. There's there's huge structures that. Uh, underground cities that could have housed hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, in Egypt, I know there's miles and miles of tunnels under areas like Saqqara. You can get into some of these tunnels if you if you know the right people and you have the right opportunity in a few places. And even I've even heard of tunnels in other places. In fact, uh, recently in the last couple of years, one of my uh, French friends, uh, Fred, who's also a big supporter of the channel, uh, told me that there's there happens to also be a whole series of 
underground tunnels in Lyon in, in France that they really don't know who created them or why. It's, I think they're called the fish bones. Um, they're, they're in fact, they're talking about filling them in to, to put some sort of infrastructure in place and they're, they're trying to stop that from happening. But there's, there's a huge uh, network of really underground galleries, almost like the Serapium galleries uh, in Lyon that, that some people have gotten into. There's a couple of really hard to find, but a couple of sources of information for that that I find to be tremendously interesting. And, you know, I really hope they don't fill those in or, you know, knock them down so they can put in more infrastructure. I think these are the types of things we should be investigating. And in particular, there's no real explanation for who built this tunnel system in Lyon or, or why. It's just it's just not explainable by any of the history that, that we know exists there. And uh, it's not something that's being looked into. But yeah, underground... Man, that's I think that's the place to look along with on the along with on the edges uh, of the oceans. All right, one more question, and then we'll get out of here for today. Uh, this comes from a comment on uh, Instagram. I think I had been posting one of my um, sort of teaser pics about a, a video that was about to come out. This comes from Mike BK. He says, "Geez, that's a whole lot of editing on top of a whole lot of research. How much time overall does one video take?" Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I'd love to be able to upload more frequently than what I do. Uh, it's certainly not for lack of working on things. Uh, I mean, my process kind of is, or at least my, uh, my operating methodology is the antithesis of what a typical YouTube channel might be, which is, you know, much more frequent videos, much more, uh, I guess, shorter videos, that type of thing. I really do try and aim for quality. Um, over quantity with this type of thing. Uh, I spend a lot of time doing production work on my videos, but typically the process for me is, you know, it's the whole conception of an idea uh, that could take weeks or forever. Like it, it, it takes me quite a while to then to pick a specific direction, site, topic to get into. Uh, usually it comes from doing generic research or maybe I've, I research, I'm researching something else and that idea will happen. Uh, I have a number of those videos in the works, a number of those types of, uh, of themes or topics, I guess, that I'm making videos on. So, you know, I've got a, a quite a list here of stuff that I need to get to to make videos out of. But once I've picked a direction and I've picked a topic, uh, it's usually um, a week to two weeks of research, of pretty much dedicated research. That's what I'm doing. And writing. I think most of my time I spend writing my videos. Almost everything you see on this channel is entirely scripted other than videos like this or my live streams. Uh, so I spend a bunch of time doing all the research and the writing. Uh, then there's usually, once I'm happy with that, there's, you know, it's an iterative process. I'll take a day or perhaps even two days to record it. So sit down, uh, you know, say it into a microphone, edit myself. It's, it's the most painful part of it. I hate listening to myself and recording myself for that matter, which makes it strange that I've picked this particular caper to, um, to get to, to try and make a career out of, uh, and then when it comes to the video editing, yeah, that can take um, upwards of three or four days, maybe even a week, depending on the length of the video. Uh, obviously, shorter videos wouldn't take as much time, but given that some of these run into an hour long, it can just, I mean, that, and that's typically the time where I'm doing it, uh, you know, 16, 17 hours a day, just, just doing that. Like I, I, that's, I feel like I'm so close to producing a video at that point that I just burn myself out trying to get videos done. In fact, you can look at the the last thing I typically do is a little end bit of me on screen at the end of the uh, at the end of the video, and I think the the, the tube drill one is a good example. Um, you listen to how I am uh, on, on talking during that documentary when I was when I was recording it, and then the last thing I did before uploading it was to record my little FaceTime chitty chat at the end, and you can just tell I'm absolutely exhausted. Like I'm just my eyes, are, I'm just just exhausted uh, from the effort of trying to do it so uh, if anyone's interested let me know and I'd be happy to show all the recording equipment that I use both the stuff that I use in the field as well as the setup here at home how I do editing uh, happy to go into those for more details if you guys like the video please do give it a thumbs up remember to subscribe to the channel if you have any questions for me please do hit me up through email through patreon paypal however comments in this youtube video uh, if you like this let me know I will I will try to do more of them in the future but other than that, I will see you all in the next one. Cheers.